Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to be taking a further look at the 92 sideline in the Vinever variation of the French defense. In particular, I'm going to be looking at the move 7 d5, which is a very challenging alternative to the move 7 bishop b5 covered in the previous video. So the French defense begins with the moves e4, e6, d4, d5, and the Vinifer is when white now plays knight to c3, and black plays bishop to b4. And so the sideline that we're looking at begins with the move knight to e2. As before, we like to just take the pawn on e4, just try to destroy white's center, white plays a3. There are two playable moves here for black. Like, bishop to a5 has also been played, but it really does not score very well, and the engine really doesn't like it, so I'm not too interested in it. I like bishop takes c3 check. We have knight takes c3, knight c6, applying pressure onto the d4 pawn, kind of counterattacking that, while white has their knight's eye on this pawn. And here, in this position, there are two challenging moves for white, which are bishop to b5 and pawn to d5. So previously, we looked at bishop to b5. It is now time to look at pawn to d5. And here, the best thing for black to do is just to take. Like, not only does this deal with the threat on our knight, which is, you know, on a nice square, but it also opens up our bishop. It helps solve the problem of the French bishop which is that this guy is often stuck being very passive and stuck behind our own pawns. So in this position, by far the best move for white, in fact the only good move for white, is to play queen takes d5. White has to take this pawn because otherwise black will just add further support to it, and these two central pawns will just take over the game. They will just make white very miserable, like black will play like knight f6 or bishop e6, just defend this guy, and maybe get ready to push him, as these pawns kind of just take over all the squares on the white side of the board. And knight takes d5 is no good. I should show really quickly the reason why. The reason why is because black can play bishop to e6, and basically get ready to like attack the knight, and threaten to remove white's castling rights if the knight moves away. If the knight does drop back and takes back on d1, that's still not so good because it's still quite passive. Like, black will just have very quick development, a very quick initiative. Like, if white tries to just keep the knight here with c4, for example, then this is also not good. Like, black will just keep adding pressure onto this knight with knight g7. And if white now plays knight takes e7, and it's actually best for black to just take back with the queen because the rook can come to d8. It can come there. And this position is just miserable for white. This is just not very fun. Like, material is equal, but the engine's like, yeah, black's more or less up a minor piece from a positional standpoint. All right, like, even back here, things are pretty bad. Things are pretty grim. So that's why knight takes d5 is no good. So the only move that white really has to, for playing, like the only playable move for white is queen takes d5. And here we still go bishop to e6. It's important to mention really quick why knight f6 is not a good choice. Like with knight f6, yes, we'll hold on to the pawn, but white will be getting plenty of compensation with queen takes d8 check. And if we take back with the knight... That's not so good. White will be winning back the pawn by playing bishop to g5. I'm threatening to not only double the pawns, but also win this guy after the trade. And if we try defending the pawn further with bishop to f5, then... Oops, sorry. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and then knight to d5 would win a pawn back this way. White will not be able to save both pawns, and things are just very unpleasant. In fact, it's... Most likely, this pawn that's going to drop, and, you know, this is this is not a fun position for black to be playing. Sorry. Yeah, black to be playing, so. 
Anyway, that is why knight to f6 is not a good way of hitting the queen. Instead, back in this position, it's um, better to play bishop to e6 because that allows the rook to take back over here. And that will be a very nice square for the rook to be. Rooks belong on open files. So white will generally just play queen takes e4 here. The other move that has been played is queen takes d8, but that just strikes me as very silly. You know, that just helps black develop. So queen takes e4. Black should just continue the, you know, continue developments and attack the queen. And in this position, there are two main moves for white, which are queen to a4 and queen to h4. Or, like, queen to a4 is what the engine prefers, but it's much less common. I thought I should say something really quick about that one. So, after queen to a4, best move for black is to just play queen to d4. Or, like, white has moved this queen a bazillion times, so black is getting ready to take advantage of that. That's getting ready to basically you say, yeah, you wasted so much time with this queen, I've got all my pieces out. I'm going to, you know, I'll just uh, get ready to make some threats on your position, get ready to attack you. Best move for white is to develop and defend their queen at the same time. Like, technically, the knight's defending the queen, but the knight really doesn't want to be on a4. It's a bit uh, passive there. Takes, takes, and then here, black and castle queenside. Like, black's okay with bishop takes c6 occurring. Right? This position is fine. For black, like, white does have a very slight advantage, but white does have to play accurately in order to keep the advantage. There are only three games in the Lee Chess Masters database that features this. this. There's one game in 2011 where white won, and two games in 2021, which were both draws. So overall, I, I would say black is fine here. Here, so, oh, well, you know, like, there isn't enough data to really say for sure, but... You know, I'm not too scared of this. Like, the doubled pawns, you know, they might be a little unpleasant, but black does have plenty of compensation for that in the form of peace activity. Like, black could put their knight on d5, and if white ever trades for the knight, you can take back with the pawn, and that will undouble your pawns. You know, stuff like that. Uh, so overall, black is just doing fine here. If instead, we have the other move, the more popular move, which is queen to h4, then there actually are a number of choices for black in this position. Like, uh, Grandmaster Anish Giri, he actually really does not like queen d4 because of the possibility of bishop to g5 check. Sorry, not check. Bishop to g5. I'm basically making it more difficult for black to castle queenside and stuff. But according to the engine, the move queen e5 check, bishop to e2, and then castle queenside, apparently this position is okay. But it's a very, it's again a very rare position. There are only three games in the Lee Chess Master database. Two wins for white and one win for black. So it's really hard to say hey, whether this is good from a practical standpoint. But overall, I think this position is fine. fine. And um, another move that is very rare and hasn't been played very often is Bishop to F5. Basically just opening up this e file and also attacking the pawn on c2 i haven't looked too much at that one but the engine says it's fine it fine and yeah it look again looks okay there are many ways of playing but the move that grandmaster giri recommends which is also perfectly fine is queen to e7 basically just preparing to castle queenside and then here whites will often play bishop to e3 just to deal with the fact that black was putting their queen on this file, lining it up with the king, so white really doesn't like that. You know, black will castle queenside generally, white will play bishop to e2, and then here in this position, it's important to notice that um, even though white has the two bishops, um, black does have you know, advantages of their own. In particular, black has a very important short-term advantage in the form of peace activity. Like, black's pieces are a bit better placed at the moment, and like especially the rook and the king. Like, black's king is a bit safer, and the rook is already on this open file. 
Oh, so Black can use that activity to, you know, try to force a trade of the of the light squared bishops or force one of these bishops to be traded away like the bishop pair is white's main advantage in this position but black does have ways of getting rid of it of dealing with that uh, so generally the move that black should now play is knight to d5 uncovering a discovered attack on the queen in and if white takes then black should take back with the d knight and because you know blocking the rook and get ready to put the knight on f5 or some other square here and really quick back in this position the other main move for white is bishop to b5 but again it's a very similar idea you play knight d5 after the queen trade you take back with the knight and it'll be defending this guy on c6 and you know black is fine black is doing fine black has more or less equalized out of the opening and there are enough dynamics on the board for the game to be interesting. And now, all I gotta do now is just, you know, find a good game aim that features this position. Okay, let's take a look in the database. Yeah, let's let's open up chess base. There are probably lots of games over there. Okay, I'm looking at chess base and Oh, oh dear. Oh, this this doesn't look good. Almost all the games here are draws and or wins by white. Yeah, white wins the vet, you know, most of the games here. This isn't good. Well, what am I going to do for my series? I like showing games where black wins. Uh, I guess I might have to end the video here. Like nobody likes watching a boring draw. Boring draws, they're they're boring, you know. Oh, uh, well, uh, be sure to like, comment and subscribe, everyone. And I guess I'll take a look at uh, the E takes D5 sideline next. Uh, uh, until next time, and. Hang on. What's this? Is someone trying to call me in the middle of my video? That's a bit rude. Okay, uh, I guess I'll take this. Um, hello? Oh, there actually is a game. It's not in chess space, it's in the Lee Chess Masters database. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, there is, in fact, a game here. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so white was an FM and black was an IM. That's fine. 99% accuracy! Hang on, everyone. I'll, I'll be right back in a moment. I'm back. And yes, the game is indeed very good. So before continuing, I thought that I should just introduce the players really, really quick. So with the white pieces, we have Fide Master Antonio Laucono, or Laucono. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, he is a uh, Fide Master from Italy. I unfortunately cannot find much further information about him besides that, although very often with Fide Masters, there's like... Very often they're not getting Wikipedia pages, sadly, or things like that. Uh, but anyway, hey, odds are there might actually be some resources written in Italian. Italian, I just unfortunately couldn't find any. And with the black pieces, we have International Master Krishna CRG, or if you prefer the eighty, sorry, the Asian slash Indian name order CRG Krishna, as in Asian countries, very often. You'll present yourself as last name, first name, you know, stuff like that. And he is an IM from India, and he has a rating currently of 2480, and he also has two Grandmaster norms, so I suspect that he's going to become a Grandmaster very soon, as to become a Grandmaster, you have to have a FIDE rating of 2500, so 2480 is a very high rating for an IM to have. And he's got two out of three norms, so, you know, very impressive stuff. He is also a coach. And, uh, yeah, especially judging from how well he played this game, I, I suspect he's going to become a Grandmaster soon. And this particular game was played at the 20th Spilembergo Open in 2022. I believe that's um, uh, somewhere in Italy. Since um, I did find information about the tournament, although it uh, appears to be written in Italian. 
So uh, more information about the players and the events can be found in the video description. So now back to the game. So Black has just played Knight to D5, uncovering a discovered attack on White's Queen over here. So White has to do something about this, because not only is the Queen hit, but also this Knight might take the Bishop over here, or it might take the Knight over there, and it might mess up White's pawn structure. So, you know, White has a tricky decision to make, and White almost always will just trade the Queens. So Black takes back with the D-Knight, right? So that's the Rook, you know, its file is kept open, and this Knight can jump to F5, you know, stuff like that. White now castles, as king safety is still quite important. Even if the Queens are off the board, there are still Rooks, and Rooks can potentially be strong attacking pieces. We now have knight to f5, bishop to f4, we have knight fd4, hitting both these guys over here. White wants to, of course, prevent a trade of the bishop pair, like, avoid losing one of their bishops, and also avoid losing pawns. So white plays bishop to d3, and black plays bishop to f5, and mission accomplished. Black has managed to force whites to part with one of their bishops. Bishops, like basically the bishop pair was really the only real thing that white had going for them in this position. And now that has to go away. We have bishop takes f5, knight takes f5. We have rook fd1, knight cd4 bringing this knight in. Black is going for the these knights in your face strategy, as the kids might say. Actually, they probably don't say that. I am very cringy. Anyway. Black is, again, attacking the pawn on c2. So white defends it. Now, defending it like this is not very fun. But the alternative isn't so good either. They're like rook d2. That's not so fun either. Anyway, this position. Black now plays pawn to f6. And here, pawn to f6 is not a bad move by any means. Because even though... Like, normally with pawn to f6, the issue is that it weakens these two diagonals. And, you know, that's bad since pushing a pawn forward once square is supposed to be a defensive move. And these two diagonals are very often very critical because your king is usually on one of them. In this case, that's not, an, that's not a problem whatsoever because white has no light square bishop. So white can't actually play on those two diagonals. So black plays f6, just increasing control of the dark squares. So white now plays king to f1, as we are getting into an endgame. So king activity can be very important here. Black plays pawn to h5 with kind of two ideas. One is to just uh, add some control to that g4 square so that white does kick the knight on f5 away. You know, that could be a bit annoying. Another idea, which we might see a bit later, is just pushing this pawn down and maybe improving this rook by opening up the h file. So anyway, white plays knight to e2. White kind of realizes that this knight is much better than the knight on c3, which isn't really doing a whole lot. It's kind of a silly knight. And black's like, eh, I quite like my knight. The knight's actually pretty passive on e2, so I'm just gonna go back to e6 with tempo. I'm gonna be hitting your bishop now. So white plays bishop to d2, retreating the bishop. Black plays knight to c5. I have dancing around with the knights. Knights trying to improve their pieces. White plays bishop to b4, hitting the knight. Black plays knight to e4, or, you know, getting out of the way. Okay, here, white now plays knight to f4. Like, what you can kind of see is that even though there's a bishop versus knight imbalance, black is kind of slightly better in general just because, you know, black's pieces are a bit more active than white's. Right? It's like, basically, this rook is, in a way, better than this silly rook, which maybe this rook can be good if white, like, manages to push the c-pawn or something. But black now plays pawn to c5, hitting white's bishop. We have bishop to e1, which is a little bit passive, but the bishop didn't really have many good squares to go to. One thing that black is doing with all these pawn pushes is putting their pawns on dark squares and increasing their control of uh, dark square color complex. 
Black plays knight d4. White now plays pawn to f3, which improves their bishop, allowing it to come to this diagonal. Black plays knight to d6. Part of the point of pawn to c5 was also just to add some overprotection to the knight on d4 so that you know, black can allow their rook to take their eye off the knight for a moment. We have bishop to f2, knight to c4, knight's hitting both of these pawns over here. That's pretty annoying. White retreats with knight to d4. Retreating is not so good, but again, it's much easier to play black here than it is to play white just because black is very active. Black's pieces you know they're happy having a lot of fun. Black now plays pawn to b6 because this pawn was under attack. Pawn to b6 also adds some further control to the dark squares. White goes for pawn to b4. Or basically trying to do something about all this control, trying to make a break. Black plays cb4. White plays ab4. Black plays knight f5. Right, we have rookie 1 now. Now, knight f5, maybe black did not want to trade their knight for the bishop. Maybe black's arguing, hey, my knight's better than your bishop. And also, there's the fact that when facing a lower-rated opponent, she might want to keep more pieces on the board, because less pieces on the board, more likely you are to get an endgame, like a drawn endgame, that kind of stuff. And here, black played rook d7. Apparently, the engine doesn't quite like this, but rook d7 is a fine move. White now played king to g1. Black played pawn to h4. We have rook to e4. Basically, black sending their h pawn down, trying to grab some space, also restricting the bishop a bit. Also trying to improve this rook as well, that's another idea. Knight cd6. Rook to g4. King to b7. Getting the king off of, you know, the same file as the rook. Also maybe getting ready to activate the king or maybe bring things to the c file. Lots of possibilities. Like, many great moves are multi-purpose. Like, they all often have multiple ideas behind them and be very flexible. So we have knight to e1. We now have pawn to h3. Trying to open up the h file and also maybe mess up white's pawn structure a little. Give white a weakness on h2 perhaps. We have pawn to c4. White's trying to do something with this rook. Because the rook was, you know, a little bit silly over there. We have knight to f7. Pawn to c5. Knight to e5. Arriving just in time to defend the c6 square. You now stop c6 check, you know, that kind of stuff. Also hitting the rook. So again, another two-purpose move. Rook e4. Probably threatening some sneaky stuff with rook takes e5, pawn takes, and then pawn c6 check, winning, you know, winning material. So black now takes, b takes c5, b takes c5, knight to c6. Next we have knight to c2, rook h to d8, doubling up on the bubble up, as the kids might say, I don't know. g takes h3, black lost their pawn, but in exchange, these pawns are now weak. So black will most likely be winning back at least one of those pawns. Rook d1 check. Rook takes. Rook takes. Rooks are kind of an exception to that kind of rule about trading pieces as very often it's easier to win when there's one rook versus one rook as opposed to two rooks versus two rooks. Wait, we have king g2. Pawn to a5, sending this outside pass pawn down the board, trying to distract white a little. We have rook to f4, kicking the knight around, forcing it to a worse square. Black's like, you know what, I think I'm okay with trading in here. I think this is okay. And white's like, eh, I'm not sure I like that trade. That's a little sketchy. I don't like what you're doing with that. We have knight to e3 check. King to g3. Knight to d5, hitting the rook. Rook to g4. Knight to e5. That's coming up with a very interesting idea. Rook takes g7 check. King to c6. Takes, you know, activating another piece. Like, black's pieces are a little bit better than white's, even though white has, you know, managed to, you know, win some pawns. Like, white's extra pawns are kind of these two silly things, which are going to be a little bit hard to push, especially the guy in the back, because 
Now the guy in the front is in his way. Okay, so, so even though black might be down two pawns, it's actually very interesting because the engine actually just considers this position equal. And very often what that means is that um, one side will likely have an easier time playing their position than the other side. That's very often the, the case. So we have rook to a7. Black now plays rook to d3. Black is going to be winning back one pawn, at the very least, because black is hitting both the knights and this pawn. And white now made the losing move. White played the move. Rook takes a5. And if you want, you can now pause the video and try to see why is this the losing move. Why did this move kind of lose white the game? What What's wrong with it? It's, so I will reveal the reason in three, two, one. So the reason why this move is bad is because it's because black has a very strong attack on white. Right? Like not only that, but uh, black actually has a way of you know forcing the win of one of white's minor pieces. And really, to win the game, like, if black's up a minor piece, black just needs one pawn on one pawn. Although, I guess, you know, it might be very difficult to win with two knights against, like, like if white manages to sack their knight. But, you know, this knight's kind of very far away. Yeah, like, black can try to trade the knights. Anyway, I should just show the line. Rook takes f3 check, hitting both the king and the bishop. If the king runs to h4, black will just take the bishop and be quite happy. So white's like, okay, I'll move my king here. We have knight to f4 check. Again, forcing the king to move. If the king goes to g1, then black can play knight takes h3 check, and then probably knight takes bishop. Probably something like that. Although king to g1 is the better move. Like, white should play this, and then takes here... And then knight takes, because if rook takes, then king can take the knight. Knight b4, rook f4, just moving the rook away so that this knight can be freed up. Knight a7 check, king to c7. And then, like, overall... Okay, this is kind of interesting, kind of just trying to repeat, but anyway. Overall, black's still winning here. Here, but, you know, it'll be a little bit more complicated. Okay, knight c3... Stuff like this. And here, engine doesn't even want black to take this pawn. But, uh, what's it called? Black is still winning here. Like, an advantage above minus two is very often enough to win. Although, black has to be careful that white might be able to sacrifice their knights for uh, black's pawn over here. here. Black has to watch out for that because mate with two knights is very difficult. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, white played king to f1, which is not as good as king to g1. It loses this bishop a different way. And black now played knight fd3, which is by no means a bad move. Oops, just getting ready to, you know, take this bishop. Engine prefers knight ed3, but we should tell the engine to be quiet because really it's a difference of minus 5 and minus 4 and... There is no practical difference between those. Wait, rook a6 check, king d5, rook d6 check, king e4. Black is just bringing their king in closer, getting ready to have their king participate in an attack. attack rook d4 check, king f5. The king is kind of also defending this pawn. King e2, rook takes f2 check, king d1, knight takes d5. And it was in this position that white now resigned because white does not um, white does not really have any compensation for the lost bishop. Like these pawns are really kind of more like one pawn because they're just so slow, oh, and stuff. And also they're not very far advanced. That's that's another issue. So these pawns are pretty irrelevant. Black's just gonna hit them from behind and kill them. Them. And so white decided to resign here. Here, like, if, if I were playing this game, I would probably continue on for a few more moves, but white's probably a much better player than I am. White probably saw, you know, a very quick way for black to win. Like, it's very possible that 
Black might actually have like ideas of setting up a sort of mating net. Like maybe put one of the knights here and try to maneuver the other knight um, to give a check or thing like that. Although that's kind of difficult with this rook. You know, here, here like this. Let's maybe play this knight here, that knight there. I, I don't know. But anyway, this was a very, very well played game by Black. Like, um, when I said this game is 99% accuracy, I wasn't kidding. kidding. Like, the accuracy kind of varies depending on, you know, I guess some random factors and stuff. Because one time I, you know, turned it on and, like, basically requested an analysis and it said 99% accuracy. Another time it said 96%. But overall, not a single move that Black made in this entire game was bad. And I did not see a single bad move. Every every move that Black made was awesome. Every every move was amazing. So I hope that you enjoyed this game. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to be taking a look at the um, E takes D5 sideline on move four. So uh, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye for now.